captain's log, day of discovery. Today, our junior crew members declared their independence. While the young cadets explored uncharted territory, the Admiral and I discovered the Fountain of Youth. Later, we were treated to a royal banquet. And after a brief skirmish with pirates, we celebrated with cannon fire. Disney Cruise Line. When it comes to pleasing everyone, the difference is Disney. Hi, Mike Jacoby here, inviting you to join us again for Jazz tonight as we kick off the 2015 season. This year, the summer of Sinatra, dedicated to old blue eyes celebrating his 100th birthday. Each week, we'll be bringing you a new artist that's appearing in town, look behind the scenes and find out what they've got going on in the recording studio and find out what else is going on live in their lives. Jazz tonight, right here on KCAT. Hello and welcome to Jazz Tonight. I'm Michael Jacoby, executive producer of Jazz on the Plaza and host of Raising the Standards on KSCO Radio. And welcome to what's our last show for 2015 as we end uh, what's been a magnificent summer, if you will, a very good year as our tribute to uh, and homage to Mr. Sinatra on his 100th birth anniversary continues. And we're ending in a big way our old buddy Spencer Day. Hey, Spencer. Hi. Nice to see Thanks you, Thanks for dressing up. Oh, you thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's casual. We were rushing. We were, we're rushing we here. You couldn't even We'll be dressed shoes. up tonight. Yes. <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. Good to see Good you, too. This is, uh, what, your third appearance here? Yeah, third, third time. And yeah. you are Hope I get a, to keep uh, doing it. Yep. Well, you're, you're penciled in for every third year, whether we need Love you. Love it. Um, you are, uh, have long been uh, an audience favorite here, and... Uh, we're so delighted and particularly um, excited about this year because it's been since you were here last that we've started the theme thing and we've done the, the Gershwins, we've done Cole Porter this year, of course, uh, with the 100th anniversary, we're doing Sinatra and we're doing Duke Ellington next year, but uh, tell me about Sinatra and uh, the effect he's had on you growing up. Well, uh, growing up, a lot of people would ask me if, uh, if I listen to Sinatra, and, I, and actually, growing up, I listened to a lot more of the female torch singers, Julie sure. London, sure. and then Ella Fitzgerald, and Billie Holiday. Um, I don't know if I felt too close to it or something, but he was always there. I mean, you can't. It's like, you know, missing the moon or something, yeah. if you're referring to the world of uh, classic standards and jazz. Um, and for me, it's been a really amazing thing to rediscover him as an adult, especially in the last couple of years. Um, I've been invited to sing with a lot of big bands, and um, I, I always appreciated it, but it was always kind of in the backdrop. And it's so much a part of our culture, kind of the way Marilyn Monroe or yeah. Elvis would be, that sometimes it takes a while. You have to step out of it to really appreciate, uh, appreciate it fully. And one thing that I've really come to appreciate is uh, how conversational he is. Um, it really sounds like he went in, did one take, put out a cigarette, yeah. and said, let's do this, which is oftentimes how it really happened. But um, there, there's an effortless ease to the way he kind of floats over all of the arrangements, which has been something, as I've even been preparing for the show tonight, that it, it, his, his rhythm and his phrasing is just fantastic. So Well, it's interesting, and uh, I was talking to Paula West about it once, and she had rediscovered the Gershwins, which many of us have, and, and boy, there's... Um, there's a book that once you open, that goes on and on, and Feinstein will tell you this forever. But uh, there, there are always these acorns that you were totally unaware of that, that you come across. And same thing with Sinatra, when you start listening to him, all yeah. of a sudden, and uh, although by the time this, fo this uh, show airs, you will have been long, on, long gone on your way. But, I mean, you're doing a, a tune uh, uh, tonight, the coffee song, which is really obscure but very hip. Yeah, well, it's... It, it, what I love is even the kind of, I don't want to call them the throw throwaway songs, yeah. but kind of the, the B-side songs that were novelty songs, even those, the writing and the wordplay yeah. will be so clever that, yeah. you know, there's so many great rhymes and, and quirky little things about it that it's good. But we were kind of going through, me and the band leaders, we were putting it together, of who already had big band arrangements. So yeah. we had Please Be Kind and some other ones that I'm really excited to do some Count Basie arrangements. Uh, but we, we were in need of like two slots filled and he actually volunteered it really? and I listened to it. I was like, that's great. Let's do it because people will not be expecting that one. Please Be Kind is one of the great uh, politically incorrect tunes. <laughs> this, is my, this is my first affair. The so Ashley Madison uh, anthem <laughs> it's like, or something. It's like, wife, it's like wives and lovers, you know. You just yeah. It's a little easier to get away oh, with. Oh, I met Jack uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, 
a, a year ago. And it was so he he did that. And he's like, yes, it's a sexist song, but it's my sexist song, so I'm still kidding. We had him here a few years ago. Yeah, boy, yeah. the chops are great. Oh yeah, Sounds oh yeah. Terrific. Although I told him if he did the love boat, I wouldn't pay him. Oh. So. <laughs> And actually, he did a kind of cool bossa nova version of it. Uh, talk about growing up uh, at your house. Music in the house? Tons of music. Um, my mom sang opera and played piano. She could play Beethoven sonatas. But uh, being a kind of an unhappy and rebellious kid, I, um, you never do what your parents want you to do. So she tried to give me lessons, and I wouldn't take them and have regretted um, and of course now she can sit back with a very smug satisfaction yeah. because it's what I do. Uh, it's my life. Um, but music, I, I now, did really... Did you take classical piano? No. 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 I, it's, yeah, I, I really came into around 19. I, I, I think we all played a little bit, an occasional hymn here or there. Um, but no, I mostly played by, I still play by ear, mm -hmm. which is good when I'm learning these big can band arrangements music? and charts. I can very slowly. Like, you would never want to just put Hello. Hello. A, a score. Yeah, it's like, it'd be like, da, 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 da. I'm like, da, 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 da. but I can. I've, I've kind of taught myself over the years, and that's been my real education, has been working with amazing musicians, Larry Goldings, who, sure. of course, plays with James Taylor, and um, so, so many people, I mean, that, whether Dave Cause or Chris Bode, or there's all these amazing people that... From that, and even playing with the big band tonight, that's that's my yeah. school because I never got to go. But um, I do think my mom, be, loving music so much, really played a huge role because music was always around me. Did your dad play? No, my dad. Uh, uh, I think, according to my mom, they're not, I haven't really been close to him for you know for for many years. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, quoted as saying he did not care for music. So yeah. <laughs> they divorced after that. But um, uh, yeah, I don't think he was he was really into it and he wasn't supportive because my mom really wanted to sing and, and play. And now, so where'd you grow? They was not a good fit. Utah. Utah. Yeah. You Mormon? Uh, not even more. Not I'm kind of like Unitarian <laughs> Buddhist now. But I'm very but I'm very you grew up in culturally a Mormon still. Don't put baby in the corner. Kind of. Uh, it was very kind conservative. Of, uh, yeah. Uh, we'll learn to dance maybe someday. Yeah. And I think I think for my mom who's still Mormon and I'm very close with her sure. and very supportive of sure. her as she is of me like yeah. I all pray with her just you know, kind of cheer her on sure. and then she comes and meditates with me and it's it's, it's right. really cool um so but it's uh, good to bet on insurance yeah <laughs> <laughs> well I just figure it's all kind of pointing to the same place sure. and and I'm, right. I'm happy I'm happy she's supportive of me and why would I not be That's supportive right. of, of the path that that works for her but I think um it was complicated for her because it's always kind of like the 1950s in rural yeah. Utah um, and, and she's a very creative, artistic, free-thinking kind of person, so it's, it's been yeah. interesting to kind of follow her as, journey. As Frank says, whatever gets you through the night. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> you have siblings? I do. Uh, five. Five? Five, uh, and then Say a couple. you are more. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't you, say. You took yeah. kids away from Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, do, do, they, uh, do they play? Uh, my, my brother who lives, actually just moved to Petaluma. Um, he was living in Japan for a couple of years. He is a high school music teacher. That oh, cool. is what my mom does too. And um, most of my siblings, yeah, sing or play to some degree. My older brother uh, sang opera too. So growing up, he was he was. I, I that's one reason I started listening to all these female torch singers was that they could kind of whisper their way to something. And Chet Baker, Chet Baker was the first guy Chet that Baker. I really got into. Well, our friend John Prue. Um, yeah. 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 Does an awful lot of Chet Baker. Yeah, that for for me because my brother had this really big operatic voice, is beautiful, and I couldn't do that and sing it. And then I started hearing these recordings from the mid '50s when microphones got good and you could kind of uh, whisper yeah, your you, way through something. If you, I mean, I mean, you listen to Sinatra and you listen to the booming voices as well, and then all of a sudden you hear Chet Baker and Mose Alice, and you go, oh, "I can do this." You know, mm -hmm. you don't need the huge voice, well, and then you kind of build it around that, which which I, I think your style is very much like Chet. Yeah, well, I mean, ballads are really my, my strength. But now, I mean, I've that's what's great to rediscover the Frank Sinatra is over the years I've learned to, yeah. you know, kind of project and bring a bigger sound. But um, what I love about Mose Allison and Chet Baker is just how, and Blossom Deary is how you can do so much with, with, with a little and how, and even Frank Sinatra too, there's so much that you're not doing crazy runs necessarily yeah. to make your point. Which is, my big regret about this series is Blossom died before I could book her. She was remarkable. She was going to sing it? a song of mine. Yeah, I did a co-bill with her in oh, New York. Wow. 
And Nellie Mackay kept Nelly chasing her she, after she, she's obsessed with Blossom yeah, Deary, oh, that's trying right. to <laughs> corner her at one point. Um, she should give royalties to Blossom Deary. Yeah. To Nelly. Oh yeah, she's she's that's her biggest inspiration. But I, I had a song called "The Last Train to New Jersey," yeah. and Blossom Deary wanted to sing it, and then she passed away. Yeah. I've had that as we were mentioning yeah. with uh, um, Les Paul yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of You're great people. Luck. Like yeah, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I, don't give me any. Don't tunes, don't touch you. me. Yeah. Uh, tell me so. Would you consider yourself, I mean, were you playing or singing as a very young man, or is it something you got into as we get to adolescence? Or, uh... Uh, I didn't really. I was um, I was kind of a really troubled um, kid. I don't know if you want to call it artistic disposition or more clinically bipolar, too, or what. But um, I, I really was kind of uh, unhappy and, and probably not headed down a good path in my early 20s around, you know, the... The, um, in the Book of Mormon, the great Joseph Smith says that your body is a temple, and I still think that's true. Right. But the great John Mayer says your body is a wonderland. That's true. And uh, <laughs> I think I got the messages confused when <laughs> I was growing up. Wonderlands are much better to explore than temples. Um, so in my early 20s, I was kind of you know, around some bad people making bad decisions, yeah. which is what your early 20s sure, are kind of for. Yeah. Um, and then a friend heard me sing in the shower and bought me my first Casio keyboard. And that really, it gave me a place, to, an outlet to suddenly take all these heavy, you know, feelings I had and turn them into something. And that's when I really got serious about it. And I started playing dive bars and then retirement homes in Palm Springs. And then it kind of <laughs> just went from there. But uh, it w I came to it really late, um, which in some ways I wish I could stay. I started but were you, earlier. You do a lot of your own stuff. Uh, were you writing poetry as a kid? Um, I was actually, yeah. They were kind of more as opposed to lyrics. I mean, you're just writing it. Yeah, I think kind of long Sylvia Plath, disturbing, sure. <laughs> unhappy. You know, and my first songs were kind of like that too. They'd be ten minutes long. They they really were. They were they were journal entries basically. Yeah. Um, and I very quickly when I was playing these you know piano bars and and things realized that people wanted to hear me sing standards. And when I started in Palm Springs, um, I met Ann Miller, I met Carol Channing, I met oh. Betty Hutton, I met all these old MGM film stars. And, and they would uh, pass along sheet music yeah. How neat. The, uh, of you know really obscure uh, songs. And a lot of them, because I grew up Mormon and we couldn't really listen to a lot of you know sure. contemporary pop music, I, I, I knew from my grandparents already. So they were kind of amazed that you know, a twenty-year-old kid, new doctor, lawyer, and engine well, chief, or... and, and the marvel <laughs> and the marvelous tunes that were written in, in the twenties and thirties for for Broadway productions had the great verses that no one knows. I mean, Bobby yeah. Short made a career out of it, and I live for finding those. The verses for those when yeah. you can get them are, are my favorite thing to find. So that's yeah, that's how I kind of came into it. <laughs> we're talking to Spencer Day. You're watching uh, Jazz Tonight. We're gonna take a little break and be back in just a few. Hi, I'm Bruce Gomberg, and you are watching K-Cat. And welcome back to Jazz Tonight. Michael Jacoby with you, continuing our conversation uh, on our uh, artist who is headlining our finale of the Summer of Sinatra, Spencer Day. Uh, we were talking about, uh, I had Carol Channing on the radio show once, what a nice lady, God, and uh, Tommy Toons. And oh, I'm, I'm, what a good guy. I he's, just connected with him this last year, I'm hopefully getting to work on a, a musical nice with him. Man. Yeah, what he's a great. Nice man. Uh, you know Michael Feinstein well. Um, I don't know him well. I've had frozen Spencer yogurt Tyler. with him, <laughs> and um, he's he. I've seen him at, a, a, at probably three different shows yeah. here, so I'm fr friendly friendly with him. I, um, but I look forward to getting to know him better. Yeah. Uh, Michael has the place which you've played uh, in San Francisco, Feinstein's at the Nico, which I highly recommend to folks. It's a marvelous. Did you ever play there when it was the Raz Room? I did. Yeah. And, and oddly enough, for some reason, there are better sight lines and better sound. And I didn't think they could improve that room. But yeah. They, they've done a marvelous job. It's, it's true. There's not really a bad seat in there. And, I, and I've always felt that the way to see certain kinds of music, as in jazz or cabaret, mm -hmm is up close and personal, and we actually make eye contact, and that room allows that, and it must mm -hmm. be a joy to work with an audience. Yeah, I really, um, I, I, I really prefer intimate shows, I mean, you know, m money wise, when you play to, to you know, yeah, to, I mean, there's, there's an 2,000, 3,000 seat house that, um, you know, uh, well, that's a great experience too, there's so much energy coming at you, when I played the Hollywood Bowl, I mean, there's 16,000 people, 
but I very quickly realized like quirky little jokes and things that work for a couple hundred people (laughs) don't go over. Everything's got to be big strokes. Like, how are you doing? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Good looking time. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my favorite, my favorite thing to do is like a good 350 seat maybe that size room is uh, because it's it, there's enough energy coming at you but it's still intimate that it's like hosting a party in a living room yeah. or something cabaret first of all let's define it how would you define cabaret uh well i think there's two definitions the words kind of thrown around a lot i think um people use it in a negative sense referring to an amateur broadway singer who's doing like a vanity show yeah. in a club where like there's three family. people in the audience um, but really cabaret is, what makes something cabaret to me is that there's a concept and a theme and, and storytelling. So not only are you telling songs, and intimate too, a cabaret is definitely intimate, but it's been great to know so many uh, great avant-garde cabaret performers in New York, uh, you know, uh, Meow Meow, Lady Rizzo, uh, Justin Bond, all these people who are really kind of embracing the more German Weimar roots of it, which is that I think cabaret usually has something subversive and kind of a message to it. But um, at at a minimum, there's always a a theme and and an element of putting the songs together in a way that it takes the audience on a journey and it's really, it's kind of like a mini Broadway show kind of. Uh, Yeah, I I, I get, it's also, I I think a party. I mean, there's something about seeing a cabaret show is that the, there, you'll, there, there'll be the thinking side and the inspiring side, but there's also the kind of let's party, let let loose a little bit. It's kind of a it's a grown up show. Yeah. So are you are you doing? And so when I when I say Feinstein's, does your show? Do you design a show for when you're playing a cabaret spot that's a little bit more? Will you talk a little more? Oh yeah, you know? yeah. There's a lot of jokes and humor and kind of med medleys and and um, yeah, we have a lot of. I'm I'm really happy in the last couple of years because I think when I um, when I first had my songs on the radio, that was one thing that people would be surprised when they would see us is that you know we we have a sense of humor yeah. and I don't yeah. I don't take myself too seriously. I think in a in a in a good way, try to be serious about the the music, the parts that matter. But um, uh, yeah, when, um, I really try to bring that cabaret spirit even when I'm playing larger performing art centers. Um, because I find that it's a way to give people a reason to care, especially if you're giving them a lot of new music that's original. Um, giving them an entrance point of telling them why you wrote it and telling them your backstory, it kind of lets them in, which is why Broadway musicals are successful because, uh, and an audience can take in a whole night of new music because you're invested in a hero's journey. And it, it gives you something to relate to as opposed to here's a song I wrote, there's another song I wrote. And even, I just saw Chris Isaac a couple of weeks ago, and even even the best you know rock and pop people, I think, have elements of the cabaret, of, yeah. of stringing together a theme and giving the audience a reason to care, really. Well, I think you really hit on it with the word backstory. I and mean, I think people, uh, well, I know people love that. For instance, and Michael is such a master at it, not only because he's wonderful, but because where he's been and what he's done. Yeah. If you can start a sentence with Ira and I, it makes it makes for a compelling story. I can, but it's a different Ira. <laughs> yeah, it's a different Ira. <laughs> we talked with that guy. Today. Hi, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> no, he lives. He lives yeah, he's still place. alive. Um, t- talk to me about um, you. Are you with the label now? Uh, no, I'm no, independent so right now. Yeah, and I'm, that's I'm, a, a tool, uh, a double-edged sword. That, uh, yeah, there was a time. Uh, you needed to be with the label, and you got to the label because you need their support. And but then there was a time when labels quit giving support, and finally you pick it up, you pick up the gauntlet on your own, and you you start taking it, it in your control. It's a very interesting time. It's kind of like the dark ages for yeah. music. But I I um I mean I don't know if you followed this, but like the Pharrell song Happy has right. 180 million listens on Spotify, and it's made him six thousand dollars. Really. So for, (laughs) if I have a song that has 200,000 listens, it's like $19. So let's all go to the strip club. (laughs) You know, making it rain all night. Find a rich stripper Uh, because we're not going to leave much. Um, So it's a really, I mean, I don't, I'm I'm on really great terms with Conquer, my my last record label. And I was just writing for David Benoit and Jane Monheit. um, And, um, but it's, it's not really a time yet. Yeah, they're, so the, they're you kind of figuring money it out. In record sales. There's no money. Sales. So their entire business model is gone. I mean, I, this is, movies are getting affected by this to a degree too, yeah. but not as bad music. It's just obliterated. So it's anyone's guess and someone's going to figure it out. Yeah. Mark my words. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who it is, I mean, but someone's going to figure Swift out. Taylor tried to take a handle on it, but, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I respect what she was saying because she's one of the few artists that, you know, is actually making money. But it, it affects everyone down, you know, the engineers, because... Um, but once people get used to getting something for free, it's kind of sure. hard to, to... Is there more that. more of a live market now than there was yeah. 10 years ago? Um, well, it's the only. So, But what's happened is a lot of the... You have um, people who are way up the totem pole who are taking gigs that they probably wouldn't have been caught dead taking 10 sure. years ago because sure. they're not making the money in record sales and revenue. So it's pushing everyone down a level. But I think, once again, the intimate venues and cabaret, I think that that's not going to die because also you don't really need to be able to sing to put out a record now. I don't know if I'm yeah. breaking this to anyone, but the auto-tune, those things are so good live even. There's samplers where you can start to sing, I, I, I think. I've, I've seen a couple big pop acts who, I, I know some of the drummers in their band who have kind of, I'm leaving their names out of it. But they, um, you start to sing and it catches the beginning of your consonants. And then if you go off pitch or you run out of steam, because a lot of times the pop singers are doing all these dance moves that it really is impossible to sing while you're doing some of the things that, you know, the Britney Spears type groups do. Um, then a sample kind of takes over of your voice and it fades it out so it doesn't look like lip syncing because you can see that someone's really breathing and singing. But when I was at the show, I was like, something's just kind of... There's kinda, an asterisk. Something's... And, but I think even if the audience doesn't innately know, I think they can feel it. And I think that's going to just make, it may be a boutique thing, but I think that's going to make the interest in intimate performance all that more important because you can't lip sync when there's only 200 people there. What's Everyone the, can tell. What's the machine? I saw Surreal on me use it. Uh, and she did, uh, um, she did a tune where you sing into it and then it repeats. Oh, a loop, a yeah, loop, looping machine. Like a that's looping really machine. cool. Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's yeah. really interesting to see. Well, and she she explained it. She was going, "Here's what we're gonna do." Yeah. And then pretty soon it's nine channels or nine it's levels. It's amazing. You know, I've never I've true. never quite figured you out how to do yeah, that. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was very hip. And I'm not even trying to knock on the technology for the people who are doing it, or even the auto tune and all that too. It's just that I think that there's totally different trains of thought and once again I, I can't do those dance moves anyway so I'm not trying to knock on a big pop star lip syncing because I can't <laughs> I'll do some cheesy Charleston moves for you or whatever so um, it's just a different it's a different totally different animal and there's a lot of people who are bringing the best of both who've got the goods and the talent and embrace the technology too so well yeah there, there's something um, uh, about cabaret and uh, whether it's cabaret or in a, a small venue that, that is that is so honest and so uh, naked and vulnerable that, that's really marvelous. You and me, kids. You know, yeah, I'm gonna do this. Well, and I figure you're naked anytime you get up in front of a group of people, yeah. so you might as well let it hang out and you, be yourself. You have, um, <laughs> so to have, speak. Are you gonna sing "Take Me to Theater Aid"? Uh, oh, tonight the too. I can. Do that for me. me. Do that oh, sure. For me. You got it. And this is one of the great songs. Take it. Written for... Is that the name of the song? Well, Mary Lincoln's Last <laughs> Night Out. <laughs> and it says, are you going to take me to the theater? It's just... You oh, never take me dancing anymore. <laughs> take, me, take me to a show, is basically. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Daybreak, which... Uh, uh, well, I would normally... I was about to say it was going ugly, Buck, which is getting... Uh, uh, Number one on iTunes, number one on different charts, and now that I know you can make twelve fifty. Yeah, well, it's, it's <laughs> I'll buy you a pizza. <laughs> We're not even going to the strip club. One of those small ones. Not, <laughs> don't get crazy. Um, tell me about Daybreak. Um, well, well, with that I, I'm I'm working on a, a concept album with an eighteen piece big band I play with in LA. Fantastic group called the Budman Levy Orchestra, and for that, I mean, it's a real pop and jazz fusion. Um, called Angel City, all based about living in Los Angeles and kind of using L.A. as the backdrop for this um, uh, record. And in the meantime, though, I wanted to do something that really reminded me of, like, the Southern California of my childhood and just do some songs from the 60s. So we did five covers and five originals, and we just went in to did it all cover? live. Um, we did uh, some N Nancy Sinatra. We did The Association, uh, Peter and Gordon. Oh, I love it. Um, and then five originals that we thought would be kind of complimentary to that. Um, just, I mean, we really just said, let's go in the studio for two days. Let's cut some tracks and put it out. First time as an independent artist um, doing that in a while. And so the fact that we were number one on iTunes, which once again, I'll buy you a yeah. small pizza for, <laughs> well, for whatever that means. But I uh, know you did the thing on Conquer, the, the movie of your life, which was... Just, no, that, I did that before I was in Conquer. Yeah. Was, I, every time I play it, I get calls. It's, it's just terrific, too. Oh, great. We're, we're actually on... The, it's going to end this new record I'm doing, so we're re... 
orchestrating it and reworking that one mm-hmm. for the, the the new record I'm doing. Now you're um, I don't know if you've been doing it for a long time. But you're doing a lot of stuff in Mexico. Yeah, yeah, I have. And down in Puerto Vallarta, that's got to be hip. I was down there earlier in the year, and it's uh, it's I'm a sorry, great I missed town. you. It sounds like, it, and you're doing it with a, a big band as well. No, I play actually with a, a, a Mexican guitar trio, and oh, I sing you? some songs in Spanish. Yeah. They learn some of my songs, and and uh, yeah, hopefully going to Guadalajara. Do you speak Spanish? You're like Abba. I do. Oh, you're not like Abba, doing it phonetically. Um, I some of it, I mean, I'm I'm pretty good. I'm like a seven year old. Like I'm like a really <laughs> street a smart seven year old. Music no, I mean I can I can get everywhere I need to. I can communicate great, and um, my pronunciation is good when I sing. Quando, but, um, quando, quando. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I, they don't really ask for that one. How were they like? Cucuru, Paloma, they like Historia de un Amor, and a lot of they, they well, and they like my stuff because they really like the ballads. They yeah. really like the rip your heart out yeah. romantic yeah. ballads. Um, so the album opened, uh, they still call them albums? <laughs> the I do. Is I it, do. So there is physical CD, though. I mean, it exists. I mean, <laughs> it's I mean, a real thing. I got that. It's in the car. But um, so people want to buy your product. They can they can get it online. Is that the best? Yeah, thing? I mean, it's online and and uh, um, on iTunes, and then we also ship it out. I think it's on Amazon too. They have hard copies. But iTunes, it. you can't order product. Can you? No, you just no, don't. it's just just. So I'm the, just getting used to this. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, decade. As yeah. far as the future music, because people still want music. I mean, music's not going anywhere. Now, is after is somebody fighting for you guys? Yeah, right there's a lots of stuff on Capitol Paul Hill. Paul Williams is is Paul Williams president of After now? I think um, he is, or one of yeah. uh, or ASCAP or something. Yeah, but I know because I did an interview with him, and they're fighting hard. But you guys are getting screwed royally. It's, well, once once the horses left the gate and kind of well, galloped around, say, it's yeah. I don't know. It's like charging for the Super Bowl. Um, but this guess. next project I'm going to do, actually, I don't know if I should plug it or whatever. Sure. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to crowdfund it, and I feel very now. Optimistic. We were talking. Tell me how that works. We were talking to somebody. Uh, Maria Schoenberg was doing that. Tell me how that works. You go. It's basically selling shares in a project. Well, it's not even shares. You have giveaway things. So at the lowest level, maybe for twenty five or thirty dollars, you have a signed CD that you mail people. You know, and, but it's really enlisting your fan base. To help, in some ways, you're taking the middleman, you're taking the record label out of it, who, as much as I have a good relationship with the past record labels I've been with, they do kind of dictate and have yeah. opinions about what you want to do. And so, in a way, if you have a fan base that really supports you and believes in your vision, you're saying, okay, guys, you know what, I'm going to give this away by donation or give it away for free even, but it's not free to make, sure. especially with an 18-piece sure. big band, yeah. so... Um, help me realize my vision. So it's like a Broadway you know? show. You're, you're getting investors. Yeah. And, uh, and at the top level, depending on different people structure it differently, you could be giving away points or percentage. Come to, you come to their house and cook too. dinner. Yeah. Come to- Although, like the producers, you can only sell 100% of 100%, right? Yes. Is that right? We can't sell 1100%. Um, but I think it's it's not even so much about selling as just enlisting your fan yeah. base to um, to help kind of support, sure. to bring the music sure. out into the world. So it's it'll be, an, like I said, it's an interesting... Decade ahead of us. The email should begin with the words, you call yourself a fan. So let's find out. Hey, you buddy. say you like me. <laughs> it's, sure, it's sure good to see you. It's good to see you, Knock too. Knock them dead. And uh, you. folks want to find you at spencerday.com? Yep. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the all those good CD places. The CD is uh, Daybreak. And help him out because I'm trying to get a small pizza and evening out out of this deal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and should, should I say it now? Should I make my it? announcement? <laughs> what? <laughs> no, we'll save it. We'll save it. All right, go. You got an announcement? Oh no! Well, they, I was. Oh no, no! Oh, saying, that's different. Oh, we could do that. You say it right now. We've been <laughs> well, doing this all year. Well, now it's been built up so much. I'm Spencer Day, and you're watching. K-Cat. I'm Spencer Day, and you're watching KCAT TV. You see that? You even got to see a behind the scenes look. That's it. And, uh, <laughs> and I want to thank you, folks, for a marvelous year. Uh, next year, we're doing the summer of the great Duke Ellington. Thanks to the good folks at uh, the Disney Channel for underwriting this year's show. And until next year, I'm Michael Jacoby. I'll see you soon. In other words.